Hello, everyone, and welcome to FAIR's free monthly webinar series. My name is Carrie Mulkowski, National Programs Manager at FAIR, and your moderator for today's presentation on overcoming obst obstacles to carrying and using self-injectable epinephrine. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This presentation will be recorded and posted on the FAIR website in about 7 to 10 days. Please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. If time permits, we will respond to some moderated questions for our presenters at the end of the webinar, which you may submit throughout the broadcast. Because attendees will be muted, we ask that you please submit these via our question feature in your GoToWebinar panel. For those of you on Twitter, we encourage you to join us in conversation during the broadcast. You can follow along with our webinar live tweets at our handle at food allergy or hashtag fair webinar. Funding for this webinar was made possible in part through a 2016 grant from Milan Specialty LP. We thank Dr. Sisher who serves as a guest speaker for this webinar and does not receive any compensation for his appearance. While Dr. Sisher is not compensated for his work, he does receive our sincere appreciation for his time and efforts to help educate our community. Our key speaker today is Dr. Scott Sisher. Dr. Sisher is the Elliot and Rosalind Jaffe Professor of Allergy, Immunology, and Pediatrics, and Chief of the Division of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. His food allergy research, funded by the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases and Food Allergy Research and Education, includes studies on natural history, epidemiology, psychosocial issues, modalities to educate physicians and parents, genetics, and treatment modalities. He has published over 200 articles in scientific journals and has authored over 50 book chapters. He is past chair of the Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee of the Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and of the Section on Allergy and Immunology of the American Academy of Pediatrics. He is associate editor of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice. He has authored four food allergy books for the lay public, the most recent one entitled Food Allergies, A Complete Guide to Eating When Your Life Depends on It. Dr. Sisher has been recognized by U.S. News and World Report as being among the top 1% of pediatric allergists and by Thompson Reuters for being among the top 1% of researchers for most cited documents in their specific field. At this time, I am delighted to turn the presentation over to Dr. Sisher. I thank you for the introduction, um, and I thank you for the invitation uh, for for this webinar. It's really an honor to present this, and I thank uh, the organizers and everyone involved. Um, this is entitled Overcoming Obstacles to Carrying and Using Self-Injectable Epinephrine. And as we go on to the next slide, I don't have anything specific to disclose, and we'll move right into the talk. So I'm starting with the bottom line, and the bottom line is that for treatment of anaphylaxis, we need to have prompt injection of epinephrine. And this is going to be, of course, the theme of treatment in case of uh, anaphylaxis, a severe allergic reaction. But there are also a number of issues in, in getting there, and that's going to be one of the main topic here, is to make sure that this actually happens. So why is it important to use epinephrine for a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis? So we see on the next slide, the actions of different medications that someone might use for an allergic reaction. And really, epinephrine is the treatment that provides all of the life-saving types of responses that we're looking for in, in a severe allergic reaction. It opens up the breathing tube. Uh, it supports blood circulation in a severe allergic reaction, and it works right away. So it, it actually does all the things that are perfect for reversing the severe symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction. And I'm going to go through the specific symptoms later in the talk. Now, in contrast to epinephrine, there are a number of other medicines that people might reach for during an allergic reaction. They might want to use even with anaphylaxis, but we really have to think about contrasting what they do, how they work, and when they work. So antihistamines are almost always used with, with an allergic reaction. 
antihistamines will reduce itching and hives and might reduce swelling. But even though a lot of people feel like, well, it worked pretty quickly, it, technically it takes about 30 minutes to really kick in. And so that's not going to be a life-saving medication if it takes that long to start to have an effect. And also, it's not addressing the most severe symptoms that can, have, that can happen in an anaphylactic reaction, the breathing problems and the circulation problems. The next medicine listed there is steroid, and many times when people with an allergic reaction go to an emergency room, they'll get some steroids. And the reason for that is that there's a, a theory that it might reduce some of the later symptoms of an allergic reaction. It's not even really a proven medicine for anaphylaxis, but whether it has a huge impact or not, it takes hours to take effect. So it's certainly not an emergency medication for, for an immediate uh, treatment of an allergic reaction. The third medicine on the right-hand side is inhaled bronchodilator or an asthma rescue inhaler, if you want to look at it that way, usually albuterol. And and that medication is great for asthma and it reduces wheeze. And it actually is fine to use it during an allergic reaction, but as you can see, it only reduces the wheeze. It, it doesn't help blood circulation. And so to, we want to be really careful that someone having a severe allergic reaction is not depending upon any of the medicines on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, they might be used in addition to epinephrine, but should never replace or delay the use of epinephrine. So as we go on to the next slide, we see that the plan is actually pretty simple. Have your epinephrine available, carry it with you, and use it promptly and use it correctly. That's sort of the goal, and it's covered in just these few words. But there could be a lot of obstacles to making that actually happen. And the next slide goes over what some of those obstacles and issues are. So in real life, when we look at various studies that have analyzed people who've had anaphylaxis and ask were they treated with epinephrine, it turns out that the minority end up having treatment with epinephrine, even though they had symptoms that we would all agree are, are anaphylaxis. So there's something going on resulting in underuse of this life-saving medication. Now, in terms of delaying use of this life-saving medication, epinephrine, unfortunately, doing so could result in fatality. And that's why um, we want to make sure to use it promptly and not delay. But teenagers and young adults seem to be at highest risk for not using it promptly and end up with these bad outcomes. The other issue that we have recognized is that people may not know when to inject because they may not really understand the situations where epinephrine is needed or misunderstand the use of the word anaphylaxis. And actually, many people who have experienced anaphylaxis might say, you know, I, I didn't even know I had anaphylaxis and I, I wasn't able to, you know, think that, that, that those symptoms are what I should have injected for. Sometimes people make excuses. Um, they have a bad rationale for, for delaying. They may feel like, well, you know, I've had allergic reactions before. It's, I've always made it through without the epinephrine, so I'm going to wait and see what happens. Or they might take a medication that I showed you previously, like an antihistamine, and, and rely on that to help things when really it's not going to. Or they may not want to use the epinephrine because they don't want to go to the emergency room, and they're connecting the use of the epinephrine to going to the emergency room. Sometimes uh, we've seen, especially with teenagers, that there are emotional issues that may lead to them not using it when they're supposed to. They may feel like, well, this is going to be embarrassing. I'm going to you know, not do it or, or walk away. People may have needle phobia. Um, the inability to properly activate the device can occur. People might uh, in, use it wrong or not understand how to activate it. And they may also just not be carrying it because they think that they don't need to have it in certain circumstances or just feel that it's inconvenient. So I'm going to actually be going through in subsequent slides a lot of these issues and address them and try to find some answers for them so that we can improve the situation. Let me give you a few examples uh, first of, of what can go wrong. This is a study that we did um, with 512 infants. It was a, in the, our consortium of food allergy research. And so we followed these children over three years. And these are children who came in with likely milk or egg or possible peanut allergy and other food allergies. And they reported to us 134 severe reactions. But even though we had explained to these families um, when and how to use uh, epinephrine, only 30% of the severe reactions were treated with epinephrine. And, and by severe, I, I mean real severe, coughing and wheezing or combination of skin and other parts of the body. So as I'll explain later, these are symptoms that are very clearly anaphylactic type symptoms. And yet 
only a minority used the epinephrine. So we, we had the opportunity to ask the families who agreed in retrospect that they should have given it even though they didn't. And some of the reasoning was that at the time they didn't really recognize that, that this was an anaphylactic or severe reaction. Unfortunately, 23% didn't have the medication on hand after all, or they were afraid to use it for 12%, or they saw that the symptoms were significant, but they were waiting longer because they thought that they would have to wait till it worsened to give the epinephrine. This is a study um, from a couple of decades ago looking at, oops, let's go back to the previous slide. Uh, this is a study looking at several uh, unfortunate deaths from food allergy and also some children who had some very severe reactions but but, but ultimately uh, made it. And one of the main things shown here is although the children were sort of in similar age ranges, I'll stay on that slide, um, there was a significant delay in getting epinephrine. The time to epinephrine and the fatalities, as you see from 25 to 180 minutes, averaging around 70 minutes. Whereas the near fatal reactions, although there was a spread of time when when epinephrine was given, the average was about 13 minutes. And so, again, prompt epinephrine, and 13 minutes is still a long time, but prompt epinephrine is really the goal. Next slide. When looking at uh, records of fatalities, uh, there's the similar theme of some of the same uh, issues that come up when, when there are fatalities. So these are 32 fatalities that were reviewed over a number of years. Um, the age range was from age two years to 33 years, half were male and half female. But one of the things that we, we see is that having asthma is a risk factor for this you know, worst outcome. Most everyone uh, had had previous reactions, so they, these are individuals who knew that they had uh, food allergy and, and the possibility of anaphylaxis, but only 10% had epinephrine in what was judged to be a timely fashion. So again, several examples where delaying epinephrine is potentially a really bad thing to do. And on the next slide. So how do we convince people to use the auto-injectors? You know, what are they concerned about? They're concerned about perhaps side effects. They're concerned perhaps about using a needle. Um, they may be delaying use because they're grabbing other medicines like antihistamines, or they want to wait and see for things to get worse. So what do we do about that? So on, on the next slide. So one of the things that I emphasize with my patients is the safety of epinephrine. So what, is, what are the side effects of, of taking an injection of epinephrine? It makes your heart beat faster, but so does exercise. It makes you jittery, perhaps, but you know if you drink too much coffee, that could also make it jittery. And it'll give some people a little bit of a headache or flush color, or they kind of feel like they're under stress. Those are things that happen when we're under stress. So you know these are generally mild side effects. They don't last very long. Using the epinephrine doesn't make you resistant to needing to you to the, its effect later on um, so it, it's really quite a safe medication to use Next. so this is a study that was looking at the safety of epinephrine epinephrine through the auto injectors that people carry with them are given are given by injection uh, into the leg and it goes into muscle but a way that individuals can give, I'm getting feedback, I don't know if you know that. Um, the way that individuals can give in, uh, epinephrine in an emergency room, for example, could be intravenously straight into a vein. And so this study was looking primarily at adults who were treated for anaphylaxis in the emergency room. And there were 361 doses in 302 patients. 68% were by auto-injector. 29% were by syringe treating it like an auto-injector. And then 3% uh, were given it intravenously. And it's clear that when it's given intravenously, there's more potential for side effect. And there were, there were very rare side effects with giving the injection like you would get from the auto injector. Uh, and, and the 1% uh, that had some uh, heart side effects were older adults. But really, the side effects are more with intravenous use, which is not what we're talking about here. So intravenous use could result in, in too high a dose. It, it, uh, in, enters the circulation in a different way. It's a much different thing, but using the auto injectors are quite safe. So next slide. So another argument for using it promptly is that it keeps you from having more problems. So what do I mean by that? Getting epinephrine early can mean that you may be less likely to need more than one dose. So 
Um, sometimes uh, when epinephrine is given, the, it makes the symptoms better, but then symptoms could come back and you would need a second dose. So it turns out from this study that the only uh, thing that they looked at that turned out to be associated with not needing a second dose was getting epinephrine early. So here's one argument that getting it early may make things better and then you are less likely to need more epinephrine. On the next slide, we have another example of how getting epinephrine epinephrine promptly can, can be beneficial. Um, this is from Australia. It was a review of individuals who had a known uh, possibility of developing anaphylaxis from ingesting the food that they're allergic to and were followed with time. There were um, 45 episodes of anaphylaxis. And as you can see in the late uh, green bar, those who received epinephrine promptly were much less likely to be hospitalized than those who didn't receive epinephrine promptly. And on the next slide, we have similar evidence from a much more recent study in the U.S. at Hasbro Children's Hospital where they reviewed 234 uh, cases receiving ap uh, of individuals with anaphylaxis receiving epinephrine. 70% of them had received it before they got to the hospital. And if, if an individual received it before getting to the hospital, they were much less likely, 17% versus 43%, of being hospitalized for the allergic reaction. And on the next slide, um, we will review the conclusion. So as I've said in the last few slides, we can argue and discuss that epinephrine is quite safe, especially given through the auto-injector. It can reduce the risk of hospitalization. It can reduce the risk of more doses. And it really makes people feel better. Uh, for, for individuals who've used the epinephrine, you know, it's always the case that they feel like, you know, wow, that you know, I was a little bit worried about using it maybe it was the first time, but they really felt better and that it was worthwhile to take it. Next slide. So what about actually using the devices? So there are a couple of auto injectors that are uh, available on, uh, on the market in the U.S. now. There are some others that are available globally. There are more coming. There are, you know, maybe changes in devices over time. But the studies that are out there uh, for, for many of these devices show that individuals sometimes don't use them correctly. And so it's very important as a reminder to speak with your doctor, to read the package insert, to watch the videos, which basically every manufacturer uh, now has online, and also to practice with a dummy trainer so that you're absolutely sure and everyone watching your child or for individuals for themselves or people who are just essentially care uh, givers for, for those with uh, food allergy and risk of anaphylaxis, did everyone know exactly how to use the device and use it properly? Um, sometimes the instructions will change and it's good to get an update on that. There was uh, some change in directions about, uh, for example, the EpiPen device that's out uh, in terms of holding it in place for a count of three instead of counting to 10, which was the prior uh, advice, and also about how to hold the individual to make sure that um, they're a leg, for example, when you're injecting it there, is held steady while it's being injected. Next slide. So the summary so far, we want to make sure that uh, individuals who are responsible for treating anaphylaxis have their auto-injector technique down pat uh, to discuss the benefits that it relieves symptoms and reduces the rate of hospitalization and needing more uh, injections of epinephrine if it's used promptly and, and that this is a very safe medication when used in the auto-injector forms. Uh, the side effects are really similar to exercising, having too much coffee or, or getting really mad. So in the next slide, I'm going to start to address some of the higher risk groups and some of the uh, potential barriers that we deal with. And, and the higher risk group really are teenagers and young adults. If we uh, translate that the unfortunately, unfortunate fatalities from food allergic reactions are primarily in that age group. It's not solely in that age group, but it's primarily in that age group. So as we look at what happens in those scenarios, there's often lack of accessible epinephrine or a delay in injection. Again, these are often individuals with asthma. We've seen that reactions can occur, quote unquote, anywhere, so that you need to always be prepared. Uh, there's not necessarily a pattern of severe reactions. It's it's not the case that, oh, I've had seven reactions and none of them were terrible, so my eighth isn't going to be bad, so you can't reason that way. And uh, although this has been seen very rarely, thankfully, uh, we don't want 
someone to say, well, gee, I have my epinephrine with me, so I'm not going to ask questions about the food and I'll just eat it because if I have a problem, I'll just take the epinephrine. You certainly wouldn't want to risk taking that direction. So you're not going to assume that the epinephrine is going to always work. Next slide. So we looked more into the issues that uh, affect teens and why they may not inject epinephrine or not inject it promptly. And so in this study, and we can go on to the next slide, we looked at 174 teenagers. This uh, was to learn more about their risk-taking behaviors and coping strategies and to see if we could identify some correctable risk factors that would provide advice for counseling for teenagers. And we started with focus groups and created a survey and then did an internet survey of the 174 teenagers. And the results are, are shown on the next slide. So one of the issues was about carrying epinephrine. And overall, this group was pretty good, I guess. It was 74% of the teenagers reported that they always carry their auto injector. But when you start to pare down on when they might always carry it or sometimes carry it or maybe even never carry it, you start to see that there are some circumstances that you know we can understand what the reasoning might be behind it to some degree, but certainly not having medicine with you. I mean, accidents aren't planned. So, so something could happen. I mean, if you don't have the medicine with you, you're in trouble. So you could see that when the, if we look on the left hand side if if a teenager had a small purse maybe it wasn't convenient to have it available maybe if they haven't had a reaction in a long time plan on being careful was an interesting uh selection so you know, i'm going to be extra careful so i won't bring my medicine with me but on the right hand side we have some of the social cues that happen being with friends or going to a bar or on a date uh, or wearing tight clothes again where convenience is a factor you're playing sports, so the the reasoning here is often it's inconvenient, or I'm just expect. Perhaps the reasoning is I'm not expecting to eat anything or eat anything dangerous. Um, so it's sort of a combination of deciding what the risk might be in the activity ahead, and and then deciding that they may not need to have the epinephrine with them. So um, we'll get to some ways to combat this uh, assumption that leads to risk taking behavior. But let's look at the next slide. So the other thing that was interesting to see from this study and, and very telling was that 61% of the teens who were describing serious reactions that are consistent with anaphylaxis didn't consider that they ever had anaphylaxis. So you have a teenager basically saying, you know, I, I ate the food, I had wheezing, trouble breathing, but then, you know, it was that anaphylaxis? No, it wasn't. So many times we find ourselves saying, well, you should use epinephrine for anaphylaxis, but we might be preaching to someone who who isn't really getting it because they may not know what anaphylaxis is. So we really need to think about the symptoms and not just the word, and I'll get to that later in the talk. And the next slide. So another thing that we looked at with this uh, group of teenagers was how they uh, categorized their, their personal approach to life. And we looked specifically in a subgroup that we considered to be a particular high risk. These were children or teenagers who are not always carrying the auto injector, and they also were admitting to eating foods despite uh, warnings on the label. And what we saw was that what was associated with being in this high-risk group on the right-hand side of the slide was being less concerned about the allergy, and that might make perfect sense. But the next thing, which was feeling different, and you know, the, the maybe editorial comment on that is that teenagers want to fit in. And one of the stories that we hear when there's bad outcomes is that it looks like the teenager might have left their peer group while they were having a reaction to kind of get away and not bother others um, and then end up with a progressively severe reaction without appropriately having it treated. So this idea of, of being different, the theme from that's going to show up on, on some of the subsequent slides. So let's look at the next slide. So when we asked what do you, who do you think most needs to receive education and information about food allergies, the winner by far in the eyes of the teenagers were classmates and friends. And in fact, 60% of the teenagers said that they did tell their friends about um, the food allergy, but of those who didn't, they wanted others to do it. So the summary here is that the, the teenagers with food allergy want their peers to understand about the food allergy, and, and they may not feel comfortable making that communication themselves. And if you think about the previous slide, feeling different would go along with this idea that if the if the, if your peers around you are feeling that they uh, understand the allergy that they un they understand what you're going through that they you know would 
would then be more likely to help you if there's an issue or, or you would feel less perhaps different or embarrassed about um, talking about getting a safe meal in a restaurant, for example, or, or having your medicine or using your medicine. So if we look on the next slide, this theme uh, actually carries out when we asked, what would you like your school, your high school, to do with, with regard to managing food allergies? And you know, we, we gave them different options that we might think might be helpful, like having you know, a nut-free area or allergen-free tables and things like that. But really, their pref pre preferred uh, thing to, to do is to educate other students. So it's exactly that same theme of presumably feeling that they, they want their peers to understand what they're going through and understand what food allergy is. And, and we could presume that that would make them feel less different and actually make it more comfortable for them to have their medicines and to use them and to stay safe as well. Next slide. So how do we translate some of the findings from that study into some of the barriers that, that we looked at in the beginning of this talk? So one issue is about the misperception of anaphylaxis. So I think it, it is helpful for, for us uh, to discuss. So if you're a teen listening in to discuss uh, the symptoms that would uh, result in a decision to use epinephrine. Um, if you're a, a, a parent or a caregiver, to think about discussing this with your uh, child and also with your physician uh, and, and family in terms of knowing, uh, not just saying, well, if there's anaphylaxis, use this medicine, but really teaching what the symptoms are. And we'll, we'll go through that on, on future slides. We know that there's this low rate of uh, auto-injector use, and we need to talk about uh, the treatment circumstances and review uh, the technique of use so it's used properly and promptly, and also knowing to call 911 and, and inform others of the allergic reaction and, and get help. We saw that the rate of carrying the emergency medicine varied by social circumstances and perceived risks and also convenience. So I always impress uh, on, on my families and patients the need for consistency. So you, you know you can understand an argument. Well, I'm going to play basketball. I don't have to plan to eat anything. But you know. You have to argue, well, there, there are often snacks. Maybe someone you know, is, is going to offer you something. You'll be hungry, and you might end up having to have something. Uh, imagine, although this is more, maybe a little bit more far-fetched, uh, you have a water bottle. Someone else is eating a snack that you're allergic to. They grabbed the wrong water bottle. Now you take your water bottle back, and it has contamination with some food that the other person was eating on it. You know, There could be unexpected circumstances that happen. So. Um, that argument can be made. But the other argument is really just for consistency. If you're going to have some times when you don't follow the rules and other times when you do, then it's going to be you know, just more likely to end up uh, with a problem that was unexpected. It's better to just have it all the time and to make that a habit. We also uh, want to make sure that there's an ease of carrying it. So you know, you might remember from the prior slides, having tight clothing or too small of a purse or, or, or garments that just don't make it easy to carry uh, the medication uh, could be a barrier, so making sure that there are alternatives for this. And you know that includes perhaps also having backups, so of course having an injector on site, whether it's in a school site or maybe a coach would have one. In the next slide. What about risk assessments? Uh, we certainly want to discuss with uh, individuals the risks of uh, not asking the right questions at restaurants, not reading the food labels every time, making sure that uh, they're taught uh, how to do that. And often the best way to do this is to do it gradually, so practicing under supervision. So for example, the, um, the, the child who is maybe too young to do all of the talking for themselves at least can say to the uh, person at the restaurant, I have a food allergy now, my mom or dad are going to tell you more about it. But then as, as they get older, they can you know, do more of the details on their own and also encourage peer education. In terms of the feeling different, uh, we really should address in school settings and other settings bullying and, and also have a frank and open discussion about the emotional in, in, impacts of having food allergy, and making sure that that isn't a barrier as best as we can for the um, teenager, young adult, or child um, to, to not uh, follow the right rules. So we want to make sure, sure that they feel comfortable in their environment. And as best as we can, using quality of life to make sure that there are choices and maybe for, for many people who are younger, having a point person to make sure that the meals are safe. And then finally, as you saw in a few of the previous slides, Teenagers really want their peers to know about this, but they may not be able to do the education themselves. So third-party education about allergy directed to friends and, and, and others is very important. Next slide. 
So now we're into discussing when to use epinephrine, and it's important to go by symptoms. Let's go with the next slide. So what's anaphylaxis? It's a serious allergic reaction that's rapid in onset and may cause death. That was a sentence developed through a conference that Food Allergy Anaphylaxis Network uh, in the days before FAIR and, and, and NIH conference made. But really the question is, when does an allergic reaction become anaphylaxis? And also, is that really tied to giving an injection of epinephrine? So next slide. So we're going to run through what some of the symptoms may be in an allergic reaction, hives, swelling, sometimes called edema, flushing or redness, itching, having a flare of eczema, having red eyes. Next slide. Symptoms can also affect the gut or stomach area with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pain. Sometimes people will have an odd taste in their mouth. And women may have uterine contractions. Next slide. Breathing symptoms of wheezing, throat tightness, hoarseness, repetitive coughing, shortness of breath, of course, turning blue, and, and the milder nasal symptoms, runny nose or congestion. And circulatory symptoms could be low blood pressure. Now, usually people aren't getting their blood pressure checked continuously, so, so what are you really looking for there? It's, shock is a term of not getting circulatory circulation to bring oxygen to the body, but really what you would see is someone fainting or being dizzy, lightheaded or confused. If you're feeling for their pulse, it may feel weak or it may be hard to find. And, and people may also have this feeling of impending doom. Next slide. So that FAN NIH conference that I mentioned uh, earlier that, that came up with a sentence to describe anaphylaxis also made some criteria that defines when anaphylaxis is likely. And so for this slide and the next two, I'm going to review what those criteria are. The first one is a sudden onset of an illness within a minute to several hours with involvement of the skin or mouth or lips, and or lip, mouth or lips, and at least difficulty breathing or reduced blood pressure. And again, we're not measuring people's blood pressure in the field, so to speak, out in the school or somewhere. So um, it would be by some of the symptoms that I mentioned before. So this is one way you might say, okay, this is anaphylaxis. Let's look at the next slide. This one is taking into consideration exposure to a likely allergen. So it's two or more of the following after exposure to the likely allergen. So skin symptoms, well, lips or mouth, trouble breathing, Again, the reduced blood pressure symptoms or persistent gut symptoms like the crampy pain or vomiting. So this is a little bit different than the previous one because we're putting in a, a bit of a story that there was exposure to something that was likely a problem. And then finally, but least likely to um, be the one uh, that, would, that you would be dealing with is reduced blood pressure alone with no other symptoms after a known exposure. It's very, very unusual for someone to, for example, eat a peanut and then just have drop in blood pressure and nothing else. It could happen, but it's pretty rare. But those are the three criteria that they came up with to say that this is likely anaphylaxis. Next slide. The problem with the criteria is that it indicates when a person is likely having anaphylaxis at the moment. And it doesn't really describe all the settings where epinephrine may be needed or, or would be a good idea to inject. There's a big difference between giving uh, an injection of epinephrine as first aid management at a school or at a restaurant versus being in an emergency room where someone with expertise may be checking all of the symptoms and checking blood pressure and things like that. So the argument in that first sub bullet is be generous to go ahead and give the epinephrine when you're you know, when you're in the field, so to speak, for first aid treatment of anaphylaxis. The second thing is about progressive symptoms. And so an argument could be made that uh, an individual who maybe ate a food that they're allergic to and non-allergic to and, and has, you know, one or two hives on the face, you might say, well, gee, you know, that's not anaphylaxis. As the hives progress and spread to more areas of the body, there could be a semantic argument about that being anaphylaxis or not. But even if it isn't technically anaphylaxis, that may well be a really good idea to give epinephrine uh, in that scenario, especially when you're you know, not in an emergency room and you're in a, you know, at a, at a party or somewhere far, farther from help. The next bullet is mild symptoms after an ingestion of food that previously caused a severe reaction. And in that scenario, uh, we have someone maybe who's, who's had a very severe reaction to milk before and thought they were getting, let's say, a soy cheese, and it turned out it was, it was really milk cheese, and, and, and they've had very incredibly bad reactions before, I would be uh, leaning toward giving them epinephrine, even with very minimal symptoms, because of just their history of, of 
having such severe symptoms uh, after an ingestion. And, and this could be summarized as saying, when in doubt, inject. But ultimately, what I would suggest is that you talk to your doctor about circumstances for your child or for yourself where you would inject the epinephrine. On the next slide, we have the emergency plan uh, from FAIR, uh, which is downloadable from their site. And, and this uh, nicely covers many of the different uh, pathways that you might uh, follow in terms of deciding to use epinephrine. And I would suggest that you go over with your doctor some scenarios, you know, under this circumstance, you know, should I be injecting? Under that circumstance, should I be injecting? When shouldn't I? You know, what circumstance of an allergic reaction wouldn't you have me inject it for? And, and that might vary from individual to individual a little bit. It might vary from the person who's observing the reaction a little bit. So maybe a school nurse would uh, manage something differently than a parent on a play date. Um, again, with uh, a little bit more leeway to giving the epinephrine if you're not sure what's going on. Next slide. So what about needle phobia? You know, this is an injection, and the, the auto-injectors are, are mo the ones that are out or have been out. Mostly, you don't see the needle. Um, there's one device where you do, but but nonetheless, most people know that they're giving a needle, and, and this is something that uh, is a little bit perhaps hard to overcome. Um, you know, I, I do ex uh, discuss with, with uh, my patients that there are, you know, many people who have illnesses where, where they are taking uh, injections frequently, for example, with diabetes, um, that it's a, it just feels like a small poke and that uh, it makes you feel better. And, and I almost uh, always have patients tell me that, you know, the little poke was worth it because they felt so much better. Practicing with the dummy trainer, although there's no needle in it, is, you know, very highly advised. And for some of my patients uh, who are willing, I will have them uh, at least inject not any uh, medicine, but just use a, a, a clean syringe needle uh, in the office just to talk them through giving themselves uh, the, essentially the needle penetrating into their leg. Um, this isn't something that is probably done widely, but you know, sometimes when, when the needle phobia question comes up, I'll address it with, with doing this if the child, teenager, and family want to, to do it. Um, I, I, I don't fight people to do this. Next slide. So there's another phobia that, that I call emergency room phobia, but I think, really think it happens because of a misunderstanding of the relationship between injecting epinephrine and calling 911. So the misunderstanding is shown in the first sentence. I don't want to use the epinephrine because if I do, I have to go to the emergency room. So I could argue that I hear that all the time, but I, I can argue that that's poor reasoning in a couple of ways. Um, the epinephrine is the thing that's it's going to make you feel better. Um, and so as I showed in the earlier slides, it's, it's actually going to make it less likely that you're going to need more medication or be hospitalized. Uh, so certainly, you know, from that perspective, it's better to, for all reasons to use it. But the other misunderstanding that's built into that is this idea that there's something dangerous about epinephrine or some tie to using the epinephrine and needing to go to the emergency room. But really, I would argue if you're having an allergic reaction and, and it's, a, it's a significant one, never mind about the epinephrine. I mean, you should be going to the emergency room, call 911, uh, because reactions could get worse. You could have a period where it's, uh, there's a significant reaction that gets better and then symptoms come back. So we tell people to stay in the emergency room for a number of hours for observation. And, and essentially, we want to disentangle the use of the epinephrine with the going to the emergency room. So really, a sentence that would show understanding is that the injecting of the epinephrine relieves the symptoms. I go to the emergency room to be monitored for my severe allergic reaction because the symptoms may come back or other treatments may be needed. So when I get a phone call from someone who's wondering whether they should be injecting the epinephrine, I almost always am going to conclude that they probably should be. Um, but, but I would be telling them to go to the emergency room for, for evaluation and management uh, in either case. Next slide. So I showed you the slide before, the selected evidence of uh, issues that are barriers or uh, represent that we're seeing that people are not always using the medication as we would hope that they use. I've uh, reviewed a number of, uh, or all of these in terms of the situation and what we might tell people. I'm going to summarize that on the next slide. So here we have the selected solutions, emphasizing, and so this is a summary, emphasizing the safety of epinephrine, emphasizing the benefits. So remember, again, the uh, reduced risk of hospitalization and the reduced risk of needing more medication. 
um, to discuss ways to improve the uh, ease of carrying it and, and accessing it, so the, the convenience factor. Review the symptoms that you would uh, give the injection for and also the technique to make sure that the medicine is being used correctly. And then practicing the scenarios of when to inject. It's also important to address the emotional barriers, whether that's embarrassment or feeling different or, or the needle phobia. And, and very important to include peer education in this, but also education of anyone who's really uh, responsible for recognizing and managing anaphylaxis, the person who has the allergy themselves or those who are um, around them. And then I would say to rehearse uh, using the epinephrine and the circumstances. And that could be done with your physician. It could be done um, with the school nurse. It could be done at school. It could be done among family members. You know, what would be the circumstance of using this? And I often, um, in, in my practice, will say to a family after I've talked about all these very stressful things, I'd say like, okay, so, you know, you have your uh, your 18-month-old in your arms and you're you're in the store and uh, you you hear uh, you're looking for a cake for your friend and there's some free samples of cookies out and you hear a little crunch crunch oh my gosh you know Jane grabbed the cookie and took a bite and we don't know if the allergens in there so you shake Jane and say Jane what have you done and there's crumbs flying out of Jane's mouth and 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 then she stops breathing what do you do and most of the families you know will say well there's breathing problems I'm going to give the epinephrine but they kind of lost sight for a few seconds that really, most likely Jane is choking because you know she had a cookie in her mouth, you got panicked, you shook her, she's a baby, she, some crumbs flew out, but others flew back, and now she can't breathe, she needs the Heimlich maneuver. And so really rehearsing you know, when epinephrine would be used, um, what, what might mimic um, allergic reactions, for example, someone going out with asthma, having a cold, running outside in the, in the cold weather and coming back in wheezing who didn't eat anything. Sure, epinephrine might reduce their wheezing. It would be fine. It wouldn't hurt anything to use it. Um, but, you know, they're having an asthma episode. So it's really helpful, I think, to go over uh, examples of, of different scenarios. And I would encourage you to do that as well. So the next slide. I have references from the, the various studies that I uh, discussed during this talk and some others that I think would be helpful if you'd like to delve deeper. deeper. And on the next, last slide, I thank you for listening, and I hope that uh, some of the things that I reviewed today will be helpful uh, to bring home to your family, uh, for yourself, uh, to teach others, and hopefully uh, reduce some of those barriers to promptly and appropriately using self-injectable epinephrine for severe allergic reactions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sushner. For everyone listening, um, this is Carrie Mokowski, National Programs Manager at FAIR. We had a little bit of audio difficulties at the beginning of this webinar, so I just wanted to let you know um, you didn't get a chance to hear Dr. Sushner's impressive bio, but for the online version that we will post online, um, this recording, we will make sure to have that available to you as well. So. At this time, Dr. Sushir, we did get a couple questions um, in through the chat box, if you're available to um, maybe take a shot at a couple of them. Um, sure. What, yeah, great. One that came through was, do we know why symptoms can vary from reaction to reaction in the same person? That's a terrific question, uh, and there's one answer would be we don't know exactly, but the other answer would be that there are a lot of nuances. A lot of times people say like, oh, you know, the allergy test level must say how severe your allergy is, but that's not a great predictor. Um, from time to time, a person uh, might have ingested a different amount of the food, you know, so that's the difference. If, you, if you're if you allergic to something and you have a, a tiny bit versus a large amount, you might expect a, a stronger reaction from the larger amount. There are also a number of things that are called eliciting factors or enhancing factors that can happen that, that make a person on any given day more responsive to a uh, food in a bad way um, than they are on another day. And those include exercise. Uh, so if you eat a food uh, and are not exercising versus eat that same food, same amount, and, uh, and are exercising, the reaction can be more severe. We think that has something to do with how uh, blood flow works and how it's absorbed uh, into the bloodstream more, uh, into whole form more and, and more rapidly. There could be more severe reactions if alcohol is taken, probably also for a similar reason that it, it makes the uh, allergen get into the bloodstream more easily from the stomach. Um, using uh, aspirin products like uh, uh, ibuprofen and, and aspirin type uh, medications probably also affects the stomach barrier in a way that allows the food to get in uh, more easily into the bloodstream. 
Um, sometimes with menstruation, uh, the reactions are different. And a, and a big one is also illness, viral illness, for example, changes the way the immune system responds and, and might make a, a reaction more notable on, on one day versus another. So those are just some of the variables that we have good evidence for, and there are probably others that we don't understand as well. Great. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. Um, another person asked, <laughs> very true, that teens can be stubborn. Do you have any tips on how to convince a teenager to carry epinephrine to something like a sports um, sports event or sports practice? Yeah. So, um, you know, you, for younger kids, maybe a star chart works. But for older teens, I mean, one of the arguments simply would be that, you know, they, they typically nowadays have a cell phone and they seem to find a place to carry it and always do. Um, you're in charge of your teen and you're probably paying for your teen's cell phone. Uh, so you can take that message and, and translate it however uh, you think it works best for your family. Um, but, yeah, I think there have to be rules, and, and also there should be shared responsibility. And part of, you know, getting more responsibility is taking responsibility, and I think that should be part, part of the discussion as well. Uh, if, if, you know, your team wants to use the car, um, they have to, you know, show responsibility. If they're going to be going off on their own, they have to show responsibility. Um, and if, And if they have food allergies, they have to, to do those things, they have to show the responsibility of, of having the medication, understanding about it. Uh, that includes also things like wearing medical identification jewelry. So I think, you know, we we it, it's good to instill uh, those habits, and it's also good to reward those habits uh, to you know to reinforce uh, that they continue to to follow the the rules that are going to be helpful and life saving. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. Um, another question we had was that um, some people are actually pretty surprised that an individual can have a reaction hours later rather than right away. Um, do we know why? So the first thing I would say is, is that that's not the typical. The typical is reactions within about tw within 20 minutes, really within minutes. So the most common thing is, is within minutes of eating the food, symptoms would start. Um, the 20 minute window is, is, is really most of the reactions, and, and under an hour is the vast majority. So when you get beyond an hour, it's really much more rare. It can happen, and there are some circumstances where longer than an hour uh, happens, but but most of the time it's really much quicker than that. And then in terms of why that might happen, um, with with some foods, it might have to do with how much is in your stomach at the time, and, and just you know having the food get to the point where it's getting absorbed. Um, the, there are some foods uh, or food allergy, rare type of food allergy that, that to meats that has to do with uh, first becoming allergic, believe it or not, to some uh, some things that are in tick bites, and then people will get a delayed reaction hours later after eating certain uh, types of meats. Um, that's the only one where it's typically several hours later where the reaction happens, and and that pattern usually gets picked up, figured out, and uh, and diagnosed. But but for most food allergies like milk and egg and Wheat, soy, peanut, trina, fish, shellfish, those types. Those usually are going to are going to be pretty quick. Great, thank you so much. Um, if the question, I'm sorry, I'll, if the question was about the hours later, sometimes when there's a significant reaction initially, I did mention that what we call a biphasic uh, or somewhat delayed reaction can happen where you get medicines, your symptoms are better, but then they come back again maybe an hour or two or three later, and that's why you're observed in the emergency room. But but those initial symptoms sort of still come on pretty quickly. Sorry. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have just one or two more questions. Um, one was in response to the fact that kids want their school to educate their peers, which is really great. Um, do you have any suggestions on how a school could do this? Um, I know sometimes, you know, in light of the schools not being allowed to share specific students' medical information, you know, definitely a, an answer I can I can give from FAIR is that we would encourage schools to educate the entire um, school community about food allergies in general, just to wear, just to um, bring an overall awareness. But Absolutely. in your study, yeah, in your study, did any of the kids um, express any kind of suggestions or ways um, that they would want that done? No, I think you. I think you actually covered it. I mean, they, they didn't want to do it. Well, some of them didn't want to do it themselves. And you're absolutely right that for privacy reasons, and also for getting back to just you know, I, you know, pointing to one person and saying we're you know we're having assembly because of this person, um, you know, that would all be very inappropriate. It, it should just be part of of the general education of the school and and food allergy um, management 
does impact you know more than just the person who has the food allergy. So it makes sense for schools to incorporate uh, educational programs associated with it. Um, FAIR has uh, those materials, I believe, so that's an option. Yes, we have plenty of those materials on our website. So if you're interested, please um, please go there. And then we just had. Um, I think that's it, actually. I don't think we have any more questions at this time. Um, so thank you so much. That was so informative and beneficial and thoughtful. Um, again, I'd like to give a big thanks to you, Dr. Sisher, for joining us today and providing some really excellent insights um, about overcoming obstacles to carrying and using epinephrine auto-injectors. Um, I'd also like to mention that we have a webinar, an additional anaphylaxis webinar, also made possible in part through a 2016 grant from Milan Specialty um, next week with Dr. Russell, who will discuss what you should do when a child in your care has a serious allergic reaction and how you can best protect a child during anaphylaxis. Um, so again, a big thank you. Um, that concludes our webinar for today. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.